guess I'm mad at things that don't matter Way too much I let the way back winds and my old friends Scatter like they were dust I get to chasing that rainbow pot of gold Riding through the pouring rain With nothing to show for it Standing there soaking with Looking up, shaking my fist as the thunder rolls Now and then on nights like this I catch a thunderbolt I want to live a life, live a life Like a dollar in the clock on the wall Don't only shine a light, shine a light Like mama's thought boards when I'm lost and lonely Stop the giving and start forgetting Be somebody that's worth Take my grudges and my old regrets And let them go I want to learn how to say a lot more yes And a lot less no Girl, I want to dance and shout And love out loud and come alive Don't want to be the guy too cool to laugh And too scared to cry I want to live a life, live a life Like a dollar in the clock Somebody that's worth the memory I want to live a life, live a life Like a dollar and the clock on the wall Don't own me Shine a light, shine a light Like mama's my porch when I'm lost and lonely Start forgiving and start forgetting Be somebody that's worth remembering Live a life so when I die There's standing room
know it's a bad idea But how can I help myself? Been inside for most this year And I thought a few drinks they might help It's been a while my dear Dealing with the cards life dealt I'm still holding back these tears When my friends are somewhere else I pictured this year a little bit different When it hit February A step in the bar, it hit me so hard Or how can it be this heavy? Every song reminds me you're gone And I feel the lump form in my throat Cause I'm here alone Just dancing with my eyes closed I've been noticing I say the same things he used to say And I even find myself acting the very same way mm. I tap my fingers on the table to the rhythm in my soul And I jingle the car keys when I'm ready to go When I look in the mirror, he's right there in my eyes Staring back at me And I realize the older I get more I can see how much he loved my mother and my brother and me and it did the best I did. Being just a little bit hard on me But now I understand he was making me Become the man he knew that I could be mm. And everything he ever did He always did with love And I'm proud today To say I'm his son When somebody says I hope I get to meet your dad I just smile and say You already have the older I get how much he loved my mother and my brother and me And he did the best that he could And 
On the evening news, saw an old man being interviewed, turning a hundred and two today. They asked him what's the secret to lie. He looked up from his old pipe, laughed and said, All I can say is, Don't blink, just like that, you're six years old. Take a nap and you wake up and you're 25. Then your high school sweetheart becomes your wife. Don't blink, you just might miss your babies growing like mine did. Turning into moms and dads. Next thing you know, you better have a 50 years is there in bed. And you're praying God takes you instead. Trust me, friend. A hundred years goes faster than you think So don't blink well, I was glued to my TV When it looked like he looked at me and said Best start putting first things first Cause when your hourglass runs out of sand You can't flip it over and start again Take every breath God gives you for what it's worth Don't blink Just like that you're six years old And you take a nap And you wake up and you're 25 And your high school sweetheart becomes your wife Don't blink just might miss your babies growing like mine did Turning into moms and dads Next thing you know, you better have A 50 years is there in bed And you're praying God takes you instead Trust me, friend, a hundred years goes faster than you think So don't blink No, don't blink Don't blink Life goes faster than you think Don't blink 
Life goes faster than you think Don't that you're here, that you came, that you care. Could we stand together and just have a word of prayer to open up? Could we do that? Heavenly Father, we ask you, we invite you to overshadow this memorial service with your presence. God, you're the only one that can bring the kind of peace and comfort that needs to come to the loved ones and the friends and the family of Barry. God, we ask you to do that today. May every good and pleasant memory fill their minds. Lord God, I pray that this entire service uh, would be uh, a strength and a help in the healing process. Every negative memory, pain, and hurt. May it all fade away, God. And may all of those memories be replaced by good memories. I pray that in the conversation, uh, in the visiting afterwards, everything that happens, good memories would be shared. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Barry Austin DeLong passed away on May 12th, 2023. Barry was born on June 11th, 1948 in Presque Isle, Maine. He was very proud to be from the county, from Aroostook County, and would call Presque Isle God's country. I have to agree with him. He married his high school sweetheart, Connie Jo Ireland DeLong, on February 14, 1970, where Barry and Connie were married for 41 years before Connie Jo's passing. They were blessed with two children, Flint and Carrie Jo. He was a loyal and dedicated husband and a good father. He was definitely a family man. Family meant everything to Barry. Barry was a graduate of Presque Isle High School in 1967, where upon graduation, he enrolled in Northern Maine Votech Institute for Automotive and graduated in 1970. He worked as a mechanic for two years before his career would take an unexpected twist. And we have a story about that a little later on in the ceremony. In 1973, Barry joined the Maine State Police, where he started first as a dispatcher, progressing later on to be a patrol trooper, and then to a senior detective. While working as a senior detective, Barry was a devoted child abuse investigator, and he actually holds the record in New England for the most child abuse convictions, and I'm told he holds that still. He had a love for children, and he would have adopted all of them if it had been possible. Barry retired from our Maine State Police in 1993. But he knew his work was far from being finished. And due to the love of the people of Somerset County, 
He decided to run for Somerset Sheriff in 1994. Barry won the election and was declared High Sheriff where he served his role for five terms, holding the longest tenure of any sheriff in county history. During his time as sheriff, Barry oversaw many changes and advancements in the department, including in 2008, the construction of the new $22 million correction facility, designed to replace the old one that was built in 1895. Barry transformed every aspect of the department for the better. For the employees and for Somerset citizens, he was a smart businessman who always looked out for the taxpayer, kept businesses local to help his community. Barry retired in 2014 and was truly loved by the people. He was an active citizen in the community and belonged to organizations throughout the years, including President of the Bingham Lions Club, Somerset Republican Party, National Police Association, National Sheriff's Association, Main State Retired Police, Commander Sons of American Legion, number 99, the Eagles Club, and so many more. Barry Todd Webellos in Bingham put together a softball team to get kids off the streets. I'm told that was a huge success. He helped to organize several parades. He loved parades. And volunteered at several functions for his community. Barry was the local counselor as well. Not by trade, he didn't have a degree, but by his great advice that he would give. People trusted him because they knew that he truly cared about them, even if he did not know them personally. He was a big believer in second chances. We need more of those today, don't we? And had full faith in people and the fact that they could turn their lives around, all they needed was a little help and a little bit of guidance. Most nights, the family would have people standing in their kitchen at dinner time, needing help. And they would always come first before he ate, probably before their meal. He truly loved people, and he truly wanted them to succeed. Barry was also a huge animal lover. He adopted and rescued several animals throughout his life. His last love was Corky, a Jack Russell Terrier that his daughter gave him. Corky was his protector and sidekick for 19 years, and he loved her very much. Barry was an awesome dad. Flint and Carrie Jo had an amazing childhood. Barry made sure that they went on yearly family vacations, and he always made them fun and interesting. He was very big on traditions. He was a very sentimental dad. They say that our father taught us through the years, do not give up on something you believe in. Live while you're alive. Love like there's no tomorrow. Be your true self and never forget where you came from. Barry was also an amazing grandfather who loved his two grandchildren, Kennedy and Kobe. He always wanted the best for them and would give them advice along the way to ensure that they succeeded in life as well. Before his passing, the three of them had a very special and memorable day together. They went for a long drive, they talked, and they laughed. He told them some of his usual stories. I'm told he was a storyteller. He had great stories. Even in his poor health, he never gave up who he was. He always knew how to get a laugh out of the grandkids. 
He would tell everyone to be good and behave yourselves, even though he never behaved himself. I like him already. He truly cared for his grandchildren. Later in life, Barry met Suzanne Johnston, and she became Suzanne DeLong on August 25th in 2018. Barry and Suzanne celebrated their wedding ceremony on beautiful Mount Kineo in Greenville, Maine. I just came from there, and it is beautiful. They were surrounded by the beauty of nature. Together, they enjoyed the love of the outdoors, going four-wheeling, taking walks, and most of all, gardening. Barry loved to plan and care for his gardens. He was so proud of them. <coughs> Barry and Suzanne loved going for summer rides in his Corvette, where there may have been a few drag racing moments. Police officers, close your ears. Here and there. They loved to travel and go on adventures, Florida being their absolute favorite destination. While together, the two of them were like teenagers, and it was awesome to see. Suzanne was a faithful, loving, caring wife who adored and wrapped her love around Barry to the very end. Barry was predeceased by his wife, Connie Jo DeLong, his parents, Harry and Lola DeLong, and brother, Roger. Barry is survived by his son, Flint DeLong, and wife, Maureen of PA, daughters Carrie Jill LeBlanc and husband Alan LeBlanc of Sydney, and grandchildren Kennedy LeBlanc and Colby LeBlanc, also of Sydney, and wife Suzanne DeLong of Madison, as well as her two children, Naomi and Bart Barnum. Barry also had some very special friends that he considered family, and they supported him until the very end. Matt Cooley, Conrad McNaughton, Mark Nickerson, Jeremy and Lisa Leal, and I apologize if I pronounce any of these incorrectly, and Milt Porter. I told you there was an interesting story about how he wound up in law enforcement. Most of you probably haven't heard it. After school, he began working as a farm equipment mechanic. A few of his friends from high school decided they'd play a joke on him, and so as a joke, they filled out an employment application for the Maine State Police. They put his name on it, filled in all the blanks, and sent it in. Sometime later, the phone rang at the, the long home. And Connie answered. On the other end of the line, she heard, this is the Maine State Police, and we're looking for Barry DeLong. Now, I don't want to say anything negative, because I really didn't know Barry, but I'm told that there were times in his life that that statement could have been frightening. But as it turned out, when he got on the phone, they said that they wanted him to report a week or so later for some tests. He didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And they said, yes, you're going to take your physical uh, aptitude test, and we're going to do a lie detector, which made him a little nervous. I don't know why. They explained that if he passed those tests, he was being invited to attend the Maine Criminal Justice Academy, and become a state trooper. Well, we all know the rest of the story. What the friends intended to be a joke was a career-changing event for Barry. Barry was a huge dog lover. He and Connie would rescue dogs and give them, make sure they got good homes. But I'm told that he was even responsible for starting a program in the jail system where low-risk inmates could actually adopt a dog, 
and take care of it. Uh, this helped them learn responsibility and give their life some purpose and hope, and it became very successful, is what I'm told. I want to recognize and honor all the police uh, officers, the law enforcement that are here today. And while I was thinking about this service, I remembered that someone named Paul Harvey had written a tribute some years ago. I'd like to read it. What is a police officer? A police officer is a composite of what all people are. A mingling of saint and sinner, dust and deity. Biased statistics wave the fan over stinkers. This is, these are not my words, this is Paul Harvey. Underscore instances of dishonesty and brutality because they make news. But what that really means is law enforcement, police officers are really exceptional. They're unusual, they're not commonplace. Buried under the froth is the fact that less than one half of one percent of policemen misfit that uniform. And that is a better average than you find among clergy. I'm reading it. What is a policeman? They are once the most needed and the most wanted. A strangely nameless creature who is called sir to their face. In other words, behind their back. They must be such a diplomat that they can settle any difference between individuals in a way that each side thinks they've won. I went to the 200-hour academy, became a reserve officer, and they talked to us about this. It's called de-escalation. It's not as easy as it sounds, is it, guys and girls? If they are neat, they're conceited. If they're careless, they're above. If they're pleasant, they're a flirt. If they're not, they're a grouch. They must make instant decisions that require months for a lawyer. But if they hurry, they're careless. If they're deliberate, they're lazy. They must be first to an accident, infallible with a diagnosis. They must be able to start breathing, stop bleeding, tie splints, and above all, be sure the victim goes home without a limp or expect to be sued. A police officer must know every gun, draw on the run, and hit where it doesn't hurt. He must be able to whip two men half his age without damaging his uniform and without being brutal. If you hit him, he's a coward, but if he hits you, he's a bully. The policeman must know everything, but not tell. He must know where all the sin is, but not participate. The police officer from a single human hair must be able to describe the crime, identify the weapon and the criminal, plus tell you where the criminal is hiding. But if they catch them, they're lucky. And if they don't, they're stupid. If a police officer gets promoted, they've got political pull. If they don't, they're just not ambitious. A police officer must chase bum leads to a dead end, stake out 10 nights to tag one witness who saw it happen but refuses to remember. The policeman must be a minister, a social worker, a diplomat, a tough guy, and a gentleman. And of course, they have to be a genius because they have to feed a family on a police officer's salary. All hard. Abraham Lincoln said, live a good life. And in the end, it's not the years in the life, but it's the life in the years. I must agree with President Lincoln. I've lived long enough now to know that everyone dies, but not everyone lives. I did not have the blessing to get to know Barry during this lifetime. 
But I already know by reading and listening to conversation that he did live his years. I want to hand the mic now to Jeremy Leo, who will speak for the law enforcement. Come on up, Jeremy. Once again, I honor all of you that are here in law enforcement. First of all, one of the first comments you made was probably nothing's going to be remembered that was said today. You want to believe that Barry's going to remember everything that was said today. <laughs> first, I'd like to thank the family for allowing me to speak today. I appreciate it, and I'm very honored to do it. I came to know Barry DeLong a little over 14 years ago when I was hired at the Somerset County Sheriff's Office. Initially, I was hired to work in the jail at the newly constructed multi-million dollar facility we are housed in today. The new jail is said to be Barry's, one of Barry's most notable accomplishments during his tenure as sheriff. And you can tell he was extremely proud of it when you saw him in the facility. After just eight months of working in the jail, I was selected to be a patrol deputy for the sheriff's office. I owe a tremendous amount of gratitude to Barry for hiring me as a patrol deputy. Barry gave me a chance, or should I say another chance, at a career in law enforcement. His decision to put me on patrol was the start of what is now over 14 years of service with the Somerset County Sheriff's Office. Office. I can honestly say this changed the course of my professional law enforcement career. You see, Barry was known for giving people second chances, both law enforcement officers and people within the general public, people who Barry came in contact while he worked as a main state trooper, as a county sheriff, and even people Barry had to arrest. He believed in giving those people a second chance. I personally know other law enforcement officers who Barry gave a second chance to as well. Those law enforcement officers are and were exceptional at their job and went on to do great things for their respective agencies or professions they pursued after law enforcement. And Barry knew that. I'm sure there are countless others who could relate the exact same sentiment. Barry didn't judge me. He just gave me a chance. Barry also had very high expectations of the people who would work for him. I remember one of the first real conversations I had with Barry after being hired as a patrol deputy. Barry told me the one thing he expects from his people is, if you screw up, own it. Barry said, I better hear about your screw up directly from you and not from reading it on the front page of the Morning Sentinel. Because those of us who worked with Barry knew that was the first thing he did when he came to work. He grabbed the morning sentinel, grabbed a cup of coffee, and a big sugar-covered donut that typically ended all over the front of his, uh, his shirt. When I got hired by Barry, I didn't know his lengthy, lengthy law enforcement career. I knew he was a retired, a retired state, uh, state trooper. But as the years went on, mostly the last nine years since Barry has retired, I learned a lot about Barry and his law enforcement career. In my job now as a detective for the past 10 years, I specifically investigate crimes against children, child abuse. Throughout my years of investigating these difficult cases, I would often hear reference to Barry DeLong and how he investigated child abuse cases. And initially, I remember thinking, Barry? I say that because those of us who know and who have worked with Barry know him to be kind of rough, not so touchy-feely on the outside. You know what I mean. But boy, did Dick Barry have us all fooled. Barry's an extremely caring man, especially when it came to crimes against children. I've learned that Barry was one of eight state police senior detectives who were selected to work directly out of the district attorney's offices. This was a new joint venture that was launched between the main state police and the district attorney's offices. When talking with people about Barry's work, he was referred to as one of the best interviewers, interrogators there was. 
You see, Barry knew how to communicate with these monsters that commit the most vile crimes anyone can imagine. Barry was able to bring himself down to those dark places most people can't fathom. And in doing so, the perpetrator would slowly become comfortable with Barry and ultimately confess to the crimes they committed. Barry worked alone on his schedule, refusing to report to a supervisor mostly. Barry knew what it took to be a successful investigator, and he did it his way. There's a reason Barry holds the record in New England for the most child abuse convictions. It's his passion for the work, his dedication to the craft, and his commitment to the countless child victims he was fighting for. I can only wish I could be half the investigator Barry was. I know I constantly strive for that every single day. I'm going to share a story with you that is probably one of the only ones that I can share. Um, there are plenty, as we've heard, that Barry liked to tell stories, but this is one that he directly he told me in a conversation at one point in time when I was visiting him. I'm sure there's others that have very similar stories and that probably would be best over a cocktail and not in this forum, but uh, this is the one that stood out to me. Uh, he said a long time ago, uh, when he was working as a brand new trooper and assigned to the Seoul and Bingham area, the same area he called his home, he got us this call for a disturbance at the Seoul and Hotel. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Today, the Seoul and Hotel has gone through a recent renovation. It looks to be an amazing place to go. Well, back in the day, the Seoul and Hotel wasn't known for its classy clientele. Now, the Solon Hotel was a pretty rough place, the kind of place all walks of life would congregate after a long week in the woods, at the mill, in the garage wrenching, or on the farm, or where any other blue-collar worker worked. And oftentimes, those people would let their hair down, and maybe imbibe just a little bit too much. Apparently, the call involved a drunken, disorderly group of people, and the management wanted them to no, Barry said he responded to the Solon Hotel, like he had many other times. Got out of his cruiser, put his steps in on his head, and went inside. Once inside, Barry could see the place was packed with many loud, drunk patrons. Specifically, he could see a small group of bikers yelling and throwing bottles around, generally causing quite a nuisance. These were guys that Barry wasn't familiar with, at least no one he had had contact with unlike a lot of the patrons in the bar who were locals. Barry said he looked over to the manager of the place, and when he did, the manager just kind of nodded his head as if to say, yep, those guys. Young Trooper DeLong tilted his steps and forward, pulled up on his duty belt, and he walked over to the group of bikers. Barry said they told the bikers, the management wants them out, time to leave. Of course, the bikers made a couple off-color comments to Barry. Let you fill in the blanks on that. And continued to drink and be loud. Once again, Barry told the bikers, hey, you gotta go. This time, one big biker got up, stood right in Barry's face, and told Barry he'd have to throw him out himself. Now, if you're not familiar with the Solon Hotel back in the day, it had a real big plate glass window that looked out right on the main street, so. Barry said he went to grab the big biker, and when he did, the biker grabbed him by the shirt with one hand and his duty belt by the other, and literally picked him up and threw him through that plate glass window right into the middle of Main Street. So, Barry said he laid on the street for a minute, stood up, wiping, wiping the pieces of glass off his French blue uniform, gathering his Stetson, landed another 10 feet from him, and he thought for a minute. He said, I can do one of two things. I can go to my patrol car, radio for help for another trooper, or maybe another hour away. Or I can go back inside. Barry went back inside. Barry said he walked in and went directly back over to the big biker and threw, to, threw him out the window. This time, Barry told the guy he was under arrest and going to jail. Barry said the bar grew quiet with all the attention on him and the biker. 
Or he said the biker stood up and said something in effect, I guess you didn't learn the first time, Trooper. But something else happened as Barry was focused on the biker. A large group of local men circled around Barry and the biker. Barry said once he realized what was happening, he heard a couple of locals comment. We got your back, Barry. He's going with you. Barry said the biker looked around at the half dozen or more guys standing around him and then slowly turned around and put his hands behind his back. I asked Barry, I said, did you know any of these guys that stepped up to cover your back? Barry said, I sure he did. Probably pulled them all over at least once, not multiple times. Gave some of them rides home on evenings that they shouldn't have been driving. You could do stuff back then. You see, these were, Perry, these were people who Barry had given a second chance. People who probably deserved the speeding ticket, the OUI charge, or some other petty charge Barry decided not to issue at that time. That's the kind of person Barry was. A person that was willing to give people a second chance, and those guys remember it when it meant quite possibly life or death for Barry that night. I'm proud to wear the uniform of the Somerset County Sheriff's Office. And I thank Barry along for it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Wow. That was amazing. And we so appreciate it. But this time, uh, State Representative Jack DeShane is going to come up and take the mic. He has a presentation from the state legislature that uh, he would like to tell us about and then give to the family. Thank you very, thank you very much. I am State Representative Jack Ducharme and as I was sitting here listening to some of the stories and so forth, I was sitting there thinking, man, I'm getting old. I've been married 40 years or more. Uh, and that just is one of those things that, you know, when you come to these events, you start thinking back of all the memories and all of the, all of the different times. Um, I've lived in the area for again, more than 40 years. Uh, I've known Barry ever since I moved here. Uh, and have tremendous respect for him. One of the things that we get to do in the legislature is honor people in our communities that do special things. Uh, and also, one of the difficult things that we do is to honor people who have passed away. The state of Maine in memoriam, whereas the legislature has learned with deep regret of the death of Sheriff Barry DeLong of Madison. I'm not going to read all of the stuff here. You've heard most of it in, in some of the stories so far. One of, the, one of the big things as far as the state is concerned uh, was Barry's record as far as child abuse convictions. Uh, I certainly would wish Officer Leo the best in that. We need way more folks doing that these days. Now, he retired from the state police in 1993 and served five terms as a sheriff of Somerset County. Uh, he was uh, involved in the construction of the correctional facility before retiring in 2014. Sheriff DeLong will be long remembered and sadly missed by his friends and family and all those whose lives he's touched. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, pause in a moment of understanding and prayer to inscribe this token of sympathy and confidence to all who share this great loss and respectfully request that when the legislature return, adjourns this date, it does, it does so in honor and lasting tribute to Sheriff Barry DeLong. This is dated May 18, 2023 signed by all the presiding officers of the legislature. This in memoriam was sponsored by Senator Brent Farron, Senator Russell Black of Franklin County, and myself, Representative Jack Ducharme.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's stand just for a minute. We got you so feel the blood going down to your feet. Take a couple of deep breaths. Smile at the person beside you, and you can sit back down. Go ahead. Be seated. At this time, um, the family has asked me to open the mic up briefly. Uh, if there's anyone here that would like to say a word uh, about their relationship with Barry, we want to give you that opportunity. And we thank you, uh, sir, for coming down first. And if there's anyone else that would like to, while he's speaking, just come over here and uh, we want to make you feel comfortable and uh, tell us who you are. They probably all know who you are. I'm going to tell them who you No, my name is Ben Bacon, and uh, I go way, way back to Barry. And he was an awesome, awesome guy. Beautiful guy. I just want to say a real quick thing about my grandma told me before she passed. She said, Benny. This world is just a testing ground. We're all going to meet again. And uh, I've followed on to that. I got a. Uh, Barry and I had a lot of fun on Facebook. Anybody on Facebook? <laughs> Nobody? Um, uh, well, he, he. He sent a poke to me. And uh, I said, uh, So anyway, uh, he called me. He says, how come he didn't poke me back? And I said, well, I don't poke me on Facebook. He said, I don't either. I'm just checking you out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, I was going to say a couple of things, but I won't let his hand make his focus. I'm really not broken. Bear's down because I miss him. And, uh, but one of the funniest things he told me was, I was, he called me up and he said, you were in that face mask, everybody wants to wear a mask. And I said, well, I have to, I'm going to store or something. Said, well, I want to tell you something, I want to store, I guess it was all pretty close here. And uh, I went in there and started getting stuff and this woman says, you're going to have to wear a mask. He said, well, I don't have one. He said, well, you're going to have to leave. He says, no, I'm going to do some shopping, and then I'll leave. No, you're not. He said, I'm going to tell you something, buddy. If I was you, I'd wear a mask full time. <laughs> and she called the police, and the police escorted him out of the store. I said, what did the police say in the car? So they just chucked it all in my car. But I just want to close by saying that everybody here, I just, I used, I had a good friend here, one Paul Davis, I, I, I like Paul, he's in, in car for that. And the favorite saying he's got, he told Mark Nicholson, you slow this car down, because I'm already shot and scared to death. I said, all right, so. So that's it. Bless all you people. God bless you all. And uh, rest in peace, Barry. And I'm going to meet again with Barry. Thank you very much. Thank you. So glad you came up. It's all right, all right. That uh, I'm going to meet again was a good lead in for a preacher, so go ahead, sir. Barry and had, over the 
years told us kids all sorts of back in the day, very long stories. And, uh, and yet myself and my young brother Michael had never laid eyes on me. So you'll understand from the stories we've gotten over the years, from Cousin Niles and the crew, uh, we were expecting, I mean, we were young. We were, we were expecting some sort of like Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, Frank Hamer combo. Um, and needless to say, I was, I was shocked at the uh, soft-spoken, warm, just genuinely caring way that this man spoke of his co-workers, his community. Um, to Barry, these were his people, and this was his community. And he was very proud of that, and you could tell. Barry DeLong was the type of guy that really wanted to see everyone around him succeed. He was a self-made, very motivated man, and a huge fan of the underdog. You know, this unique trait of Barry's would play a critical role in my life much later on. Uh, however, as we became closer slowly and over the years, I found the answer to my question that I'd had so long as a kid, all those years before, um, through our projects, rides, conversations, and time. See, that was the key and most important piece, was Barry was very generous with his time. What kept me coming back for more advice and more life lessons was simple. You always knew where you stood with Barry, whether it was what you cared to hear or not, Barry was very direct. He didn't pull punches. He didn't say face. He told it like it was. I always appreciated that, and I needed it many times throughout my life. I will say, through that advice and those life lessons, I'm probably a thousand times wiser and further ahead in life than I ever would have been had Barry not taken me aside and spent that time with me. It took years, but I hope Barry looks down and smiles, knowing he didn't waste his time with me, and that it all paid off. In the last couple of years of Barry's life, I learned firsthand why all the Barry DeLong stories were true, and why Barry was and still is the toughest guy I've ever known. <clears throat> See, growing up, Many of us young men have a very wrong idea of what tough really is. Barry taught me, tough isn't always putting the other guy down. He used to say that's expected and it's easy. He said tough is leaning down and offering them your hand and lifting the guy back up. He said it's a mental toughness. And I saw that every day with Barry, especially towards his final days, Tough was never quitting, never giving up. Tough was going to chemo time after time. Tough was just walking to the car even though I know it was so, so painful. Tough was physical therapy, hospital stays, procedures, operations. Tough was how you downplayed it all and stayed so positive. Even if you would get down, not many ever saw it and you didn't stay there long. Three weeks before you passed away, you told me, Cooley, I'm just going to get walking better. We've got a lot to do this summer. Yes, we do, Barry. Yes, we do. So in closing, if you, if you really want to learn or take something from all this and truly honor our friend Barry DeLong, you do these things, you do them well, you do them often, and you do them when no one is looking. You do them for people who have nothing to give in return and can never repay you. You lift up the underdog. You never know how far he will go with a little help. He used to tell me the world is full of crappy people. Be a good one. Love hard. Love your family, your wife, your kids. Never take anything for granted. And four, I felt that was most important. Take that trip, burn those vacation days, 
go on a cruise, climb that mountain, whatever your heart desires. Because in the end, you can't buy time. So don't waste it. Thank you so much. Don't want to leave anyone out. Such good comments and stories about Mary. To everything there is a season. A time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill. And a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. <clears throat> I've done enough funerals through the years to know that <clears throat> Excuse me, there's no magic to instantly take away the pain that you feel today. It's normal, even healthy, to grieve. And you folks are doing some grieving. But I can also tell you firsthand that the grieving of those who have faith in what this gentleman said, that we're going to meet again, that there is a life beyond this life, it's very different from folks that don't have faith in that. The Apostle Paul said, we don't grieve as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, <clears throat> even so, them also which die with faith in Jesus will God bring with him. Now you're going to hear something from a preacher that you don't often hear, but I'm going to share it. It won't be the first time. And that is that it's not church affiliation that guarantees us heaven. I believe in church involvement. I think it's good to have community. But it's not the name of your religion. It's not the church that you attend. It's the faith that you have in your heart. And in James, we hear that faith without works is dead. I'm told that Barry had faith. And one thing I've learned in this service is that wasn't just something in his head. It wasn't just something that uh, he believed a little bit, but he actually put his faith into action. When Jesus asked somebody, what's the greatest commandment? I mean, he could have said anything. He could have picked one of the Big Ten. He could have shared. You know what he shared? Some of you do. He said, love God with all that is within you. Body, mind, and spirit. And then he said the second is just like the first. Just as important. And the second was, love your neighbor as yourself. It's obvious to me that Barry DeLong is a man who loved people in his way and helped them, gave them a second chance. I'd like to read this for the family, a little bit of comfort. The Psalmist David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Can I say this? There's another verse in the scripture that says true religion and undefiled is this. It's helping widows and orphans. It's helping children that have been abused. Real religion is helping people. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I would be amiss if I didn't tell you, folks, that heaven is a real place, not a fairy tale or fantasy. And folks that have faith when they breathe their last breath of earth's air, then they breathe their first breath of heaven's air. And based on what I've heard, I feel like that's where your loved one is, where your dad is. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Mine would look more like a camp on East Grand Lake. I, I don't know what kind of mansions there are there, but if there were not so, he said, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. I can't tell you exactly what heaven is, exactly what it looks like. I can tell you some things, though, that it's not. Some things that you won't find there. You won't find child abuse in heaven. There'll be no sickness, no cancer treatments there. He's free from all of that. No pain in heaven. In heaven, our bodies will be like they were intended to be before the fall. They'll be perfect. I don't know if they'll have hair or not. I'm not sure. There'll be no black flies there. Be no pain and no pardon. You'll never have to say goodbye again. Lord, to know that even though none of us are getting out of here alive, our days are numbered, we thank you for life. We thank you for the life that Barry lived, for the people that he touched. And I pray that his memory will be an inspiration to others. We've already heard what an inspiration it is to some. There are some folks that are following in his footsteps. And we thank you for that. Once again, God, bring healing and comfort to those that are grieving. And I pray you would let them feel buried in their heart. Because if we're remembered by our loved ones, if we live on in their hearts, then we're really not gone. And one day, soon, there will be a reunion. And we thank you for that, Lord. Let your peace be on this place as folks visit and enjoy one another's company. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.